Welcome everybody. Welcome to everyone listening or watching. Glad you could join us. I really hope today's message will have practical application in your life as it did with mine. Today I want to ask you a, a simple question. What does it really mean to be the church? Or put in a different way, what does it take to be the church? What does it take to be a believer? Now, you've probably heard this question being asked many times before in, in many sermons and that's because it's been preached so many times. Preaching on what believers need to be doing. What does it mean to be the church? What does it mean to be, be a believer is, is very common. For the last, I want to almost say 100 years, that that's been a topic on many churches' lips. And the reality is we can't keep, we can't keep preaching on the same thing over and over and over again. Not because it's not practical, not because it's not truth, because somewhere along the line that teaching has to become something. That preaching has to have an effect. Now the church has been trying for so many years to get believers to, to be active. To get church members to be active Christians, active believers. And unfortunately we've been trying, the church as a general has been trying so long without much success without much success in getting people to realize that being a Christian, being a believer, being a church is about so much more than just your own salvation. And even me, in the past year or so, I've probably preached on the same thing three or four times, and it might sound redundant. But we need to realize that as a Christian, as a believer... We have to do something with our salvation. And let me, let me clear up. I don't mean we have to do something to get saved. Salvation is not something we receive because of what we do. Salvation is something we receive because of what Christ did. But that does not mean that there's not something that we have to do. That does not set us free from working. The question is, now that we have been saved, now that we have become the church, now that we have become believers, what does that mean? Back to my question. What does it take to be a believer? What does it take to be a Christian now that we have been saved? As I said before, I've preached on numerous occasions about Christians and how we should treat others. What does it mean to be the church? What does it mean to be a Christian with regard to other fellow Christians, with regard to non-believers, with regard just in general to other people? And I've said the following. I've said, yes, you have a relationship with God and you are going to heaven. But salvation, Christianity, is about more than just your own salvation. Yes, you have a relationship with God and are going to heaven. But being a Christian is about more than just your own salvation. I've said that on many occasions before. And it's true. But then one day I was telling the same thing to someone. And they confronted me with the, with the following question. And it got me thinking. The question they asked me is. Do you really have a relationship with God. If being a Christian is only about your own salvation. I'm going to ask that question again. Do we really have relationship with God if being a Christian is about our own relationship? And that really, really got me thinking. Do I have relationship with God if all it is about is about me? Like I've said, you have relationship with God and you're going to heaven, but it can't just be about yourself. But if it is about yourself... Do you really have a relationship with God? Let's read what John 21 verse 15 to 17 says. Towards the end, this is one of the last appearances Jesus made after his resurrection. So in, in effect, it's part of his parting words. 
not his final words, but part of his parting words. He speaks to Peter. Verse 15 says, When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Now what that means is, more than these, it means Jesus is asking Simon Peter, do you love me more than the others do? And that love that Jesus uses there, the Greek word, is the love with a total commitment and devotion. Jesus asks Peter, do you have a total committed relationship with me more than these others do? And that's the title of my my message this morning, with total commitment and devotion. Simon replies, Peter replies, he says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus replies and he says, feed my lambs. Verse 16, and again Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. Then the third time he said to him, verse 17, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And this time Jesus uses a different Greek word for love. The Greek word he uses here speaks of a deep personal affection as a close friend. Jesus asked Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? And he said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. What does all this mean? What is happening in John 21? It simply means that we have to recognize how important people are to God. And then act accordingly you see jesus connects the two he brings the two together for jesus a committed devoted relationship with him will automatically include taking care of his sheep when simon peter answered yes i love you jesus says feed my sheep and we have to ask ourselves that same pressing question do we love jesus with total commitment and deep personal affection and then if we answer yes we too have to respond and say we will take care of his sheep do we love Jesus we must take care of his sheep I want to read for you James 1 verse 22 to 27 says the following Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like a man who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. But the man who looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues to do this not forgetting what he has heard, but doing it. He will be blessed in what he does. If anyone considers himself religious and yet does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religious religion is worthless. Verse 27. Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this. To look after orphans and widows in their distress. And to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. What James does is he addresses two of the things that I've spoken about above. Earlier. James' message addresses firstly the issue or the fact that one cannot hear the word this message that the church has been preaching and trying to get across for so many years one cannot hear the word and not do anything about it the first thing that james addresses the second issue that james addresses lies in what it is that we need to do that that's something that our religion is made up of what is it that we need to do that will clarify what our religion is. And that he answers in verse 27. He says, 
Religion that God our Father accepts as pure and faultless is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself from being polluted by the world. We need to hear the message and we need to do something about it. And what is it that we need to do? We need to take care of his sheep. We need to take care of others. We need to recognize the importance of people. We cannot live as Christians just for ourselves. It's not about me and my salvation. If I have a committed, devoted relationship with God, I have to feel committed and devoted to His people. But let's be honest. It sometimes or or often feels like mankind and humanity is trying its utmost, is trying its hardest to make it as difficult as possible to value them. Yes, it does feel like humanity doesn't want us to value them because of how they live, because of how we live, because of what we do. But that does not give us an excuse to not value them. That does not give us an excuse to not place importance on people. Let me ask you the following question. How important are people to you? In essence, Jesus asked that same question. But he asked it differently. Instead of asking how important are people to you, he asks, do you love me? And if we answer yes, he says, then feed my sheep, tend to my flock, take care of my people. When one is in a committed relationship with someone else, it will always mean Being in a committed relationship will always mean having the interests of your partner at heart. To pursue that which your partner finds valuable. That's what a committed relationship is about. And being in a committed relationship with God is the same. God's interest has And will always be people. Me and you and everyone else. God cares about people. And when we are in a committed, devoted relationship with Him, we need to have that same interest at heart. We need to care about people. And not just about ourselves. It's not just about going to heaven one day. It's about being in a relationship with God today. Luke 15, verse 4 to 6, Jesus tells the following parable. He says, Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulder and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. You see from this section that Jesus tells us, this parable that Jesus tells us, he leaves the 99 to go and look for the one. Why? Because people are important to God. Having a committed relationship with God will then mean to have an interest in people. To place value and importance on other people. To invest in other people. A relationship with God has to flow out into that doing. The doing which James speaks of which is true religion, taking care of the orphans and the widows. Now James just gives two examples, the orphans and widows. That doesn't mean that it's, it's isolated to just orphans and widows. 
All he's saying is, there's people out there that can't take care of themselves. There's people out there that need to be valued. People are important. True religion is taking care of people. Now, I understand very well that people have different personalities. We call them introverts and extroverts. Some people excel in the company of others. Put them in a crowd and they're at their happiest. Put them around people and you see them flourish. Where other people excel in their own company. Put them alone at home with a book, just some music, maybe their dog or their cat, and they will excel. They will flourish on their own. I understand people have different personalities. What I'm talking about the, today is not of becoming a social butterfly. I'm not talking about becoming more social with other people. That's not what today's message is about. Today I'm speaking about the attitude we have towards others. How much value and how much importance do you place on people? Said in another way, how important are people to you? We need to place importance on other people and then we need to live proactively to display that value. If our attitude is positive towards people, we need to live proactively to display that attitude. And I can't give you a specific example of what you need to do. Why not? Because it will be different for everyone. Everyone has their own unique situation. Everyone has their own flaws. Everyone has their own something they need to work on to better attribute importance to people in their lives. What I can do is tell you of times where I know I have failed. I can give you examples of times where I know I have not placed the proper importance on people, where I know I have not valued people for who they are. The first example is when someone's talking to me about something that they are passionate about. And in the back of my mind, all that I can think of is, when is this conversation going to end? Second example is when I'm in town and I see someone and I avoid them because I know that they might start a conversation with me. And I'm just not in the mood for that. Third example where I know I fail to place importance on people's lives is when I ignore someone at my front door. Someone who will ask for food or money or a job. Simply because I don't feel like getting up. Final example is watching TV or watching the news. See how people react. See how people live their lives. And I think to myself, I'm glad I'm not God. Because I don't know how He loves everyone. The reality is He does. They are all His people. And we need to start valuing people. We need to start placing importance on people. It's not just about us. It's not just about our salvation and one day going to heaven. If we truly have a relationship with God, we need to value others. We need to see how important people are to God. And then we need to act accordingly. I have an idea and I hope it might be so that this lockdown that we find ourselves in that people will be forced to be more proactive in their recognition of people that people will be forced to be more proactive in their recognition of how important people are I know I have I know it's helped me to realize how important people are to realize how valuable people are 
And I also hope that people will become more proactive in, their, in themselves as the church. To realize that we can't just be dependent on, on our congregation organizing something so that we can do something about our religion. Because the church can't organize anything. We need to do it ourselves. We, each and every one of us have our own ministry field. Each and every one of us can be proactive there where we are. Each and every one of us can do something to show the attitude we have towards people. To show how important people are. I want to read to you Ephesians 1, verse 22 to 23. And I read it in the message. It says, At the center of all this, Christ rules the church. The church, you see, is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. The church is Christ's body in which He speaks and acts, by which He fills everything with His presence. You might ask yourself, where does that fit in today's message? The reality is, when we begin to recognize how important people are to God, and act accordingly, because we have a relationship with Him, I truly believe that the church will live out its calling and be in the forefront, no longer in the peripheral, no longer an afterthought. When we start placing value on people because God places value on them, we will live out our calling. The church will once again be at the forefront of people's lives. Which will mean that Jesus will be in the forefront of people's lives. Why? Because the church is Christ's body in which He speaks and acts. By which He fills everything with His presence. We are His body through which Jesus works for the glory of God. Jesus gave it all for people laid down his own life why? because people were important for God Jesus asks that question do you love me? a committed devoted relationship with him if we answer yes we need to follow that up with Jesus we will feed your sheep we will tend to your flock we will value people because you do and today we're going to partake in communion and I want to bring it together and I'm reminded of John 3 verse 16 John 3 verse 16 says for God so loved the world that he gave his only son why did He give His only Son? Because God loved the world. Because for God, people have always been important. Jesus paid the ultimate price. He gave it all. Again, why? Because of the Father's love of people. Jesus, the Son of God, in a committed relationship with his father lives out that which his father is passionate about he gives it all he pays the ultimate price on the cross and this today I want you to take this moment while we use communion to recommit yourself to God to live your life in total commitment and devotion to Him. So as we take in the communion and we take the bread, let us remember Jesus' body that He gave for me, that He gave for you, that He gave for people. Because people are important. 
Likewise, when we drink the cup, let us remember Jesus' blood that flowed for me, for you, for people. Why? Because people are important to God. Let us do this in remembrance. His body that is for our healing and His blood that is for our salvation. Let us pray. Father, I thank You for all that You've done for us. I thank You that You've given it all for Your love that You have for us as people. I pray that You will help us to value people in the same way that You value them. And that when You ask us that question, do we love You, we will answer yes and our lives will reflect how important people are to us. Simply because You are important to us, Father. That our lives will reflect a committed, devoted relationship with You. Where Your interests become our interests. Where our hearts will break for that that breaks Your heart. That we will share in everything that You've done for us that you've given for us. Thank you for your body. Thank you for your blood. That we can receive healing, that we can receive salvation through everything that you've done for us. Thank you for your love, your kindness and your goodness that continually follows us for who you are, for what you do. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Liebe gemeente, ons wil net een paar praktische relings deurgee in verband met ons offergaves en ons tiendes aangezien ons nie meer uh, by die kerk hier die drie weke by mekaar kan kom nie wil ons graag net alternatiefes deurgee ons weet daar is heel wat van julle wat al reeds online banking doen EFT's uh, vir julle tiendes en offergaves maar vir die wat het nie doen nie of nog nie gedoen het nie wat verkies om dit altyd kerk toe te bring wil ons vraag dat julle net in hierdie tyd uh, alternatiefes sal gebruik, namelijk Snap, Scan, wat ons so plus minus jaar ook uh, of een uh, jaar terug geïmplementeer het, besonderhede verskyn op die skerm, so gebruik dit of doen een online banking of enige ander methode of platform wat vir jou gemakkelijk is. Jy kan met een van ons leiers kontak, as jy meer inlichting nodig het, ons kan jy dat help daarmee en dan laatstens wil ek net sê baie dankie, dankie vir julle getrouheid nie net in die tyd nie, maar oor die afgelopen jare, ons waardeer het, want dit is wat ons gehelp het, om kerk te wees en te kom doen wat ons tot nou toe gedoen het. Baie, baie dankie, ons waardeer jylle, en ons eerdeer dat ons saam dier die ding kan werk. Baie, baie dankie.